Hi, everybody. My name is Jim Hemphill. I write about movies for IndieWire, and I am really excited to bring up the filmmakers behind Gladiator 2, starting with casting director Kate Rhodes-James. <laughs> Supervising sound editor and re-recording mixer Matt Collinge. <laughs> Production sound mixer Stefan Boucher. <laughs> Supervising sound editor Danny Sheehan. Visual Effects Supervisor, Mark Bukowski. Composer, Harry Gregson-Williams. Makeup Department Head, Jana Carboni. Hair Department Head, Giuliano Mariano. Editor, Stam Sam Restivo, excuse me. Editor, Claire Simpson. Production Designer, Arthur Max. Military costume designer, Dave Crossman. Costume designer, Janty Yates. <laughs> Cinematographer, John Matheson. And director and producer, Ridley Scott. Well, it's, uh, it's an incredible team you've assembled here, and it's, you know, you've worked with a lot of them before, obviously. I'm curious, when you embark on a movie of this kind of ambition and scale, what are the characteristics you're looking for in your department heads? What's the most important thing, and what kind of conversations do you have with them to get everybody on the same page right from the beginning? First. First, th forget stamina, then talent. <laughs> what do you True. think? <laughs> Go on. Have I got on to that? Hope. <laughs> well, let's start. Let's start from the beginning. Let's start with the casting. Actually, I want to start with Kate and ask Kate. You know, the, obviously, this is an enormous undertaking putting together a cast like this. Hi. <laughs> Um, for you, where do you even get started with this? What's, what are your highest priorities and how do you begin assembling this cast? I'm feeling very exposed as I'm seeing Ridley glaring at me to make sure I say the right things. Um, um, it, was, it was a joy on this because it, we started with a completely blank slate. Uh, no one was attached. And so Ridley and I would just discuss primarily who would be the person to become the son of Lucius, sorry, of uh, Maximus. And um, it's difficult to find a leading actor of that age that can take that on. It's also difficult to find an established actor of that age that's prepared to really, really step up. I mean, physically. Um, because, you know, we need to believe that he can do he can, he can be in that arena and fight those baboons and uh, sort, sort out that rhinoceros um, and for us to really believe it. And it's, it's, we'd all seen normal people. Obviously, everyone has seen normal people. And, um, but we went on a bit of a journey. There were obviously other people that we were talking about. Um, not but... really, dear. Not really. Get to it. <laughs> No, Don't take away my thunder. The Academy now recommend, re recognizes casting now. <laughs> anyway, so then we chose Paul, <laughs> um, who had all exactly all the things I've just talked about. And then the rest, I mean, really just correct me if I'm wrong, I'm sure you will, that um, I um, go off and do what I do, and then I present it to Ridley and we discuss at great length what he likes, what he doesn't like. And obviously it's Ridley's choice. I'm here to facilitate his vision. Um, and that's sort of where we, where we got to, I guess. 
Well, Ridley, how quickly did you know it was Paul? I mean, when you... Uh, Normal people. Mm -hmm. I, I, I watch, I need bedtime stories. And so before I go to bed, I always watch something. I tend to watch incoming, so I tend to watch low budget. BFI had a good uh, kind of, I don't know what's the channel. I tend to watch low budget films. And I caught normal people by, almost by accident. It was not my kind of thing, really. Watched two, thought the both the guy and the girl were terrific. And then I binge on eight hours. And by then, we were kind of um, heading towards a pretty half-decent first draft. So once you're working through a script, you're already having people in your head and you're thinking about who it might be. You can be right and you can be wrong. And that's a continual conversation with Kate. Well, Janty, what was your approach to... Some Janty Yates fans in the house. <laughs> <laughs> what was your approach to costuming, Paul? Because, you know, you, you're sort of competing with yourself in terms of following this iconic character that, you know, you and Ridley and Russell Crowe created. Um, what, was, what, were you, what, were you, what was your approach going in here? Well, I'm going to hand you over to David, who's my military, not mine, sorry, the military designer. And he will describe how he costumed both Pedro and Paul, who are completely in military all the way through. Thank you. Um, it, it, was, it was just a basic story of him being in kind of folksy, very basic armour at the beginning, juxtaposed with rich Roman armour, and then his kind of gradual journey to the iconic gladiator cuirass at the end. And what's the research process for you on a movie like this? I mean, it seems like it must just be massive. It is. It is, yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> Even though I'd done the one before, I started right from the beginning again. All the museums, all the art galleries. Ridley's a great um, person for art, and we were looking at all sorts of oriental art. Um, Alma Tadema, who was a huge influence on the first gladiator, second gladiator the same. We were looking, I was walking through Rome, just looking at the statues. You get so much information on costume from the real thing, you know. So, yes, everything. And a bit of internet, I suppose. Um, well, I've got to ask specifically about Denzel Washington's look, because, you know, watching the movie tonight, his costumes are just extraordinary. Um, what was your philosophy about how to dress him? Well, it was Ridley's idea that we would go... Oriental, uh, Orientalism and the painters of the 1900s did wonderful, wonderful um, concepts. And so we started with that and it just went from there in actual fact, these very wide belts, usually with a scimitar in them, we didn't do that, but also wrapping, a lot of wrapping. There's one particular painting that Ridley is was crazy about, and uh, we did try Denzel. The Moor. It's called the Moor. I didn't dare to say the you're, you're a Moor. I thought he was going to hit me, but no. <laughs> but he actually he was very happy with his garments in point of fact, and he wore them so well. And the one thing that I loved was he wore his earrings constantly, and I thought that was going to be a huge battle. But the jewelry. The wristlets, the big belts, everything. He wore it so well and, loved, and I think enjoyed it because he was playing with his drapes <laughs> a lot, which, was, which meant he enjoyed it and could work with them. Oh, yeah. I think one of the great things about this movie is the infectious pleasure that Denzel Washington takes in his performance. I mean, he's just you can tell he's having a great time, and it really is a part to the audience. And I also kind of felt that way about the actors who played the twin emperors. And I wanted to ask Hair and Makeup about those actors and working with them and creating that look, because a lot of the, you know, obviously a lot of the performance comes from the actors, but you did a lot, I feel like, to create those characters through the Hair and Makeup. So talk about your approach to the emperor twins. Uh, well, again, it was a conversation with Ridley about that, and uh, he wanted them to be, um, I will say, very edgy. And not sex, as, sex pistols. A sex pistol, yeah. And Johnny Rotten was actually the reference for one of them, especially for the um, color of the hair. Um, but it was about more about, I think, make them look very 
different for the rest of the cast as well, so stand out. So we decided to go with something that wasn't that much like academic, so not like specific Roman. So we went through other kind of uh, direction vision, so like uh, satiricon of Fellini as well. Um, so it was a mix of that, so satiricon, John Rotten, the Orientalist, all together, and that was the results, I think. Do you want to add anything, uh, Joanna? <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, already explained, well, most uh, everything. Um, the things that I really like was, the, you know, that beside the color, there was the same for both of them. But it was the hairstyle that one was uh, Geta, a more um, uh, uh, Roman, more classic Roman, you know, forward and with waves. And instead, Caragalla was more crazy and uh, more like uh, Johnny Rotten, really, a more <laughs> Sex Pistol <laughs> vibe. Yeah, that was the... Um, now, Mark, I want to ask you, I mean, this movie sort of did something that I didn't think was possible, which is it makes the first Gladiator look kind of modest by comparison. I mean, it's such, it's such an enormous leap no. in scale. No, 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 no. <laughs> no. Karen, sorry. <laughs> anyway, I'm curious from you coming on to this, what, you know, like... How exciting is it and how intimidating is it to know that you have to kind of, you're competing with a movie that's now considered a classic and you have to kind of, uh, you know, you have to deliver the satisfactions of the original, but you also have to provide something new. Uh, yeah, well, obviously the first Gladiator for me, um, for lots of people, was such a seminal, massive film. Um, I remember going to see in the cinema. I remember... Uh, thinking I could never work on something that good. Uh, I, I, it seemed inconceivable to me to, to work on something like that. So when this opportunity came along, I was, you know, I was intimidated and excited and uh, all those things. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's an amazing thing to be involved in. Uh, the action is spectacular, um, but he's got an amazing vision for it, and uh, it was fun and terrifying to do. Uh, John, for you, you know, Ridley is famous for shooting things with, you know, many, many cameras. And your lighting in this movie is gorgeous. And a lot of times cinematographers, you know, complain that multiple cameras compromise their lighting. But your lighting here is, is beautiful. How do you create those effects and reconcile that with Ridley's multiple camera approach? Yeah, you keep the lights out of shot, <laughs> which is difficult. Um, you can remove them digitally. I People know, forget you got a camera in the show. Just take them out digitally. Yeah, but we couldn't. I mean, everyone runs... Well, anyway, they didn't look very Roman, the lights. So we... we um, I've got some cameras for sale if you want. So. <laughs> uh, they're going cheap. Um, you know, it's not, it's not the easiest thing trying to get light on every angle. But what you might lose, you gain by... Um, getting it all at once, you know. And there was, uh, there's some two-handers, and there are a few two-handers in the film, but most of it is very complex. And these people are getting up very early. And when they get up that early, you know, the camera boys drift in and, you know, a bit later and say, what are we doing? You've got to be ready to do everything at once. You want to get the whole scene. You know, it takes a long time to turn a coach and four horses around. You know, that is a consideration. And then it also takes time to take a fancy prime lens off a crane and put a, put a no other lens on. So you put on the zooms, you get your light on your feet, you watch the action, you listen to what the governor says, and you try not to shoot each other. And if, that, if you get that, I mean, not everyone's all the time. It's not that we shoot everything from every angle. Number one here is sitting there and he's got a row of monitors and he's sort of with the cigar and he's going like, he's always vision mixing, right? It's, you know, it is back to that's when written start. BBC in White B City, right? Six live, live, live shooting almost, and that well, that, and that means you can be in shot because your camera might be dead at one stage. So you, you, it's not getting everything where everything, everything's going to be perfect. But to to set up to get a moment as someone leaves a room, 
and you go back for an insert and set up an insert takes a long time you know and you won't have enough horses we didn't be happy we had a second unit very small but there's no one dusting up behind us we clean up our own we do our own washing up and drying up as we go so we know we've got a scene you walk away at the end of the day you know you've got it and he prefers digital now because he can see it and he gets it he knows where he's got the cutting room we don't have to sit through rushes and he shoots off to see claire and i'm sorry i don't polish my shoes but i can't reach them 25 years ago, I had hair, I wasn't wearing glasses, and I wasn't walking with a stick, so I wouldn't <laughs> recommend, <this to, laughs> wouldn't recommend this to everyone. Um, so is that an answer? I don't, I'm full of codeine, I'm not really... <laughs> <this big. laughs> well, and, and Ridley, do you find that that approach, uh, it must help the actors as well, right? It gives them total freedom, uh, because an actor is suddenly free. Uh, there's nothing worse than 12 takes this way, and then... 12 takes that away, the guy who's off the camera initially is dying while the other guy takes 12 or 14 takes to do his thing. And I learned at BBC, because I used to do live drama at BBC with six cameras. And I did that for two years at BBC in White City years ago. And then I left BBC because doing a full play, full time director, after tax, I was making 75 pounds a week. Can you fucking believe it? And, and so I discovered one day I did a television commercial and I got 200 pounds in my hands. So I realized there's something seriously wrong with how BBC pay. So I, I left, went to advertising and learned how to be an operator on two and a half thousand commercials. But when I started doing film, I applied the six camera uh, technique to graduate film. That's, that's, that's the equation. Now, Sam and Claire, uh, how does it complicate your job to have the, you know, again, 12 or however many cameras shooting some of these massive scenes and getting all of this footage in? How do you even start sifting through it? Is this on? Yeah. Um, well, it's, it's pretty overwhelming, actually. Um, but uh, we're, we're pretty well armed with information before uh, the shoot because Ridley does these very... Uh, uh, you know, detailed storyboards, which are actually quite beautiful things in and of themselves. And um, so we've got a pretty good idea of s certainly what's, what he's after, you know, what his intention is. Um, but the volume of material, that's why it, it is so helpful to work with Sam. Um, because uh, one person just can't get through it. You know, hours of material every day, you know, six, eight hours of material. So we have um, a system where we can view all the cameras uh, at the same time. So uh, that's quite helpful. We, we sit and watch the dailies together and make copious notes. And um, uh, I, I think actually it's more of a problem for the assistants because also some of the cameras are, are, are shooting at different speeds. So we've got some at you know, 48 frames, some at maybe 72. Um, and so they don't always sync up to the sound. So the assistants have actually quite a, an enormous... Um, burden of work to, to prepare the material before we even start cutting. And um, we just uh, plug away at it, you know. Um, Ridley's great because he's very communicative and um, we talk a lot before um, we even start shooting. So we know what he's intending for the, for the various scenes. Um, so, you know, that certainly makes our job a lot uh, faster. Um, and then, of course, when we've got the assembly together, then we, we really go into the detail and the nitty gritty of, of the scenes and, uh, you know, thoroughly uh, mine all the dailies. Uh, because initially we're just getting a rudimentary cut together to make sure that we have uh, everything that we need. And when we've established that and Ridley's seen it and he's happy that he 
you know, he knows that he's got the material. Then we really go into the creative work of shaping the scenes and um, shaping the, the performances. Yeah, yeah. The only thing that I would add to that is, uh, you know, so we've got the volume of footage that's coming in and it's kind of overwhelming. But it's an exciting thing on the flip side, being like, oh my God, if only we had some like wide drone shot where the rhino is coming this one direction. Well, guess what? We have it. We, there's always like a great shot that we can cut to. So it's, it's uh, an embarrassment of riches to get the volume of footage that we have. Um, but then, uh, but yeah, it, like Claire said. The, the being both they and John are being modest. I usually have a director's cut within three weeks of end of prints of photography. And this took 51 days to shoot, so there. Well, and you know, and look at him. He's <laughs> ruined. Well, and something that's really extraordinary about the movie is you managed to combine this epic sweep with the character stuff and the details, and the, you know, it's 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 really impeccably balanced. I think um, tonally, and I'm curious: is that for you guys? Is that just kind of intuitive finding that, or do you have strategies in the editing room to figure out how to find those rhythms? We don't really have strategies. Um, <laughs> As we go along. It, yeah. Uh, we it, well. um, it, it's really intuitive. Um, and it's, um, it's an ongoing process. Uh, it, it, it evolves. The cut evolves. And also... You know what's interesting about uh, working with Ridley because he's such a visual person, you know. He, he's an artist and a painter. And even when, um, uh, when principal photography is finished, he's still tinkering with the image. You know, we do um, some screen grabs of frames and he'll be drawing on them and adding more detail and more layers of of, you know, objects and people, and um, which actually is more of a, uh, a pain for the visual effects people trying to keep up with, uh, with Ridley's vision. Um, but it adds to the story, and he, he's somebody, he, he, he tells a story through images, and it's um, it's a rare gift, actually. Well, Arthur, speaking of telling stories through images, you know, you're, there's so much to talk about with your production design here. But I guess I'll start with just your approach to the Colosseum, which again is an iconic location from the first movie. Here, you're uh, expanding on it, making it even bigger and better. Uh, talk a little bit about how you approach the Colosseum in this one. Well, my brief from Ridley was get the Colosseum up, Arthur. <laughs> <laughs> that was that was pretty straightforward. No, but ancient Rome, it's so rich, it's mother architecture. It's about, you know, the proportion and the shape language. It's all given, it's all there to, to harvest. Um, uh, comparing uh, where you started uh, talking about the, uh, the scale of the first one, at the time, uh, it was pretty big. Uh, considering the techniques that we had available, it was all handcrafted because visual effects was in its nascency. It was just beginning, and we we put a lot of effort into one sequence in the Colosseum, the 360, was where all the money went, really. And now we have so much um, more ability, not only for extending the sets visually on film, but also making the sets using... CGI techniques, computer-controlled cutting, digital drawings, all of that makes us able to build more, more cheaply and faster. So we expanded the scale, we supersized from the original movie, deriving uh, the look of it, because it wouldn't have changed that much. And we wanted it to be familiar to the audience from uh, the first one, uh, and just expanded, we built more, and higher and wider and richer and more ornate, more opulent, and then put a layer of depravity and decadence on it and filth, as usual. <laughs> um, that's 
pretty much what we did. Well, and how did the fact that you, at one point, fill it with water, how did that affect your job? Well, I thought it was a very interesting concept to shoot a sea battle in the desert. Um, <laughs> but it was much more practical. And I mean, speaking for Neil Corbold, who couldn't be here tonight, um, he came up with this brilliant idea of how to maneuver the ships on hydraulic, all-wheel drive, remote-controlled um, industrial platforms that are used uh, for moving um, immense uh, pieces of uh, I industrial turbines, uh, nuclear cooling tower type structures. And he had four of those. And, and they moved like ships. And then Mark just put the water in. <laughs> Simple. And 50, 150 ships. Yeah, I mean, we had four ships in the end, two in the Colosseum and two in the desert. Redressed them a couple of times uh, so that Mark could tile in more ships to make a fleet. Um, but the, the value of all those techniques um, made the film what it, what it is. Uh, we, we had to handcraft all the sculptures on the first movie. The, uh, same sort of scale, giant monumental statues. But we only had about half a dozen. On this, we had several dozen. And uh, they were made in various countries to meet the schedule. Croatia, Italy, England, uh, and, and also there was one other place. Um, I, no, no, no. The, the statuary was all done on very high-tech machines in sections uh, out of me medium-density foam, whereas before we would be making the old technique of a uh, steel armature, chicken wire, plaster, and clay. Uh, whereas now we could uh, just give it a digital drawing from a maquette, perhaps this big, scan it, and then let the machines blow it up for us. In Arthur, you forget that you used your set from Kingdom of Heaven. That's just a thousand feet long, so it's a good start. Yeah, well, you know, there was that, but we added another couple of hundred feet to it and changed all the towers put roofs on the towers and give it a superficial makeover to make it North Africa instead of Jerusalem. But that was the least of it, I thought. <laughs> well, something else that's really uh, makes this an immersive experience, you know, watching it again tonight in this theater with a great sound system, I mean, the sound design in this thing is just amazing. And I wanted to ask uh, Danny and Matt, uh, I guess I sort of piggybacking on the Colosseum question for Arthur, I wanted to ask, like, what are we hearing? What are the layers of sound you guys are putting in in those Colosseum scenes? Because they are really, really dense and immersive. So basically, um, the crowd for the Colosseum was one of the most difficult parts for us, um, myself and Matt. We went down a road of using um, stadium crowds, but because of whistles and the kind of jeering, it was just far too modern. But then Ridley wanted the crowd to be really specific. He wanted to sort of tell the story through the crowd for the, the rise and the fall of the main characters. So it wasn't just sort of sounds. It had to tell a story too. So um, we had to think a, think a bit outside the box. So we approached Claire and to ask if we could get on set because Ridley was still recording some of the big set pieces. So uh, Claire approached Ridley. Ridley said, yes, definitely, uh, get the guys on. So we went expecting to just kind of grab as many people as we could throughout while they were having lunch, putting their costumes on. But actually, when we arrived in Malta, we, we actually got a big win from Ridley because he had us on the call sheet and we were able, at the end of his shooting day, to take the crowd away for five full days and just be really specific with what we recorded with them. There was like six, 700 extras each day for those sort of five days we were there. Stefan is the on-set recorder, so he helped to set it all up, all of the microphones. Um, I'll pass you on to Stefan. Yes. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> yes, it was quite an experience, right? I was so happy that these guys come on the Ridley Scott set you know, to see exactly what is going on there. <laughs> it's, it's amazing. It was massive. I was walking down the street and a garrison army passed me by, then a hundred horses, and then there was a market going on down that street. For me, it was insane. It just blew my mind. <laughs> and, 
Yeah, the, the, the first, um, the, the, when I, I met for the first time at Danny, we had a conversation, and uh, but I told him that I'm going to need a lot of sound from you guys because really likes me to play on set a couple of different things, different kind of sound, and I knew that for the rhino, he's going to like <laughs> for me to play a lot of different things. So I asked Danny to um, prep something like 10, 15 sound of rhino, real rhino. Uh, and um, I remember that day when we start to film that scene and uh, we had like 500 crowds, you know, like extras. And we had Paul, we had all the stunts and the door open and you had, you, the people can see this giant animatronic uh, arriving into the arena. And then I play on a big speaker, the rah! Oh, and I can see all the people have this reaction. And then Ridley in his trailer watching all the eight different cameras. And he's always using walkie-talkie to for talking to us, you know, on set. And I can think, louder, louder. <laughs> he wanted to get the reaction, of course, for Paul and the stunts. And this is, well, this is the part of my job. I think this is one of my priority is to make the actor comfortable and to keep the energy, uh, whatever it costs, you know, to add, uh, I don't know, 10, 15 different speakers just to get and to feel like they are in the real life. Same for the extras. So yeah, this is the kind of experience that we have really <laughs> all the time. <laughs> Did you have anything to add to that, Matt? Um, no, I mean the, the Rhino scene was a was a great scene to work on for for the sound design. Um, I mean the structure of the scene naturally made it quite dynamic because we had these cuts close up to the Rhino where we could be really bold with the bassiness of the feet and the the snorts of the Rhino, and then you cut to these wides where we'd use the reverb and delays to establish the size and um, scale of the Colosseum. So it was a really um, it was a really nice scene to work on and. And Ridley, um, working really closely with Claire and Sam, and Ridley always gave us um, license to be bold and fearless with the sound. And I think we, we just tried to really go for it in that scene. Um, and Ridley was specific to say the, the, the pinnacle needs to be when the rhino hits the wall at the end and, and loses its horn. So um, that's what we tried to make, the, the biggest moment. And, and the vocals then shift to a rather forlorn, defeated rhino, a broken rhino, um, with, a, with a heron landing on its head at the end of the scene for the final, final humiliation. So, yeah, it was a lot of fun. <laughs> and Stefan, I'm curious, how do you, on a movie, again, I, I keep going to this word scale, but this movie is just so epic. How do you uh, get clean dialogue tracks and production sound amidst all of the chaos of this action? Uh. <laughs> It's really difficult, yeah, especially this one, because for the first time, I think that, I think we use eight cameras for 95% of the time. Uh, so um, John said exactly what, uh, we, we sometimes spend a lot of time to set up the scene, right. but but once it's done, we have everything, right? That's the, that's the secret. So, Basically, the problem is that my boom up could go on holiday because <laughs> there's no space. <laughs> you know, it's not that easy for them. <laughs> so my the real job was and the real challenge was to like always um, find the best spot possible to hide the microphones. And it's a big work with Genty and his team and her team. Uh, uh, and I'm so grateful for being able to work with her and to find all this different kind of um, space to put my transmitters and and my microphones. I uh, I work with, for example, the Maximus um, um, armor, uh, which is I think it's John Paldo who was take was uh, helping me to find the best spot possible to hide. Uh, the um, the small pack and the transmitter and to find the best position for the microphone as well to not have wind to keep the um, the possible way to capture the uh, breathings and the efforts and etc so it's a lot of work with uh, with Genty's team and uh, that's and David and David yes it's and uh, but well and uh, 
and after a couple of, uh, I would say it's, I think it's fourth film now with Ridley. So um, it's a, it's always a pleasure to 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 work with uh, his close team all the time. Um, Harry, you know, I loved your score for this movie so much. I mean, I just thought that it, again, you know, it's, it's one of those scores that really delivers all of the satisfactions a great movie score should in a classical way, but it's also very original. I mean, it sounds like you're using a lot of interesting instrumentation here. Um, what's the starting point for you when you start? Because this has a ton of music in it. It, it does. And, um, I mean, I think I had, uh, the first thing I had to... Uh, Reconcile was to somehow to bring the spiritual essence of the first film in, into this into our world of Gladiator too, but also these epic moments. Not to be afraid of those, but you, you know um, it's interesting listening to the editors talking about their process because you know um, I'm very much post production as opposed to a lot of production people here, um, but I depend very much on on them supplying different cuts of the film and Ridley often sends me. Uh, a scene without the rest of the movie there. For instance, the Roman invasion. You know, we had very early on, he had a really good cut of it very quickly. Um, but it's pretty intimidating. This is cut. I mean, it's a big old scene, that. Um, but, but, you know, um, and we had conversations about where we should probably, where we might want to bring back some thematic material from the first movie score. And we picked out three or four spots in the movie. Once we knew where those were going to be, I could work around that. But as you say, there was rather a lot of music that that, that, that uh, didn't relate to the first movie. But um, the, the way the characters were, were painted, um, uh, and actually the way Ridley often speaks to me as if he's speaking about a canvas, he speaks to me about in terms of light and darkness, that sort of stuff. And I, he's, it's as if he's splashing paint you know, around my studio. Um, but no, it was, it was a thrilling experience. Quite intimidating at first, I have to say. And are you using, uh, you know, just in terms of like the, the different kinds of instruments you're using, are you using instruments uh, from the period or from different... Oh, man, not necessarily from the period. I don't know about that, but well, for, for sure. Yeah, no, I, I went and hunted down various Mediterranean, North African um, uh, instruments and had a lot of fun with that, yeah. Um, and, you know, I, I actually I wanted to go back, Mark, for a second to something here. They were talking about the rhino, and this was like sort of a famous story about the original Gladiator. You watch the Blu-ray, and there's the footage of the rhino tests and things like that, and, like, you guys finally... You got the great rhino here. Um, talk a little bit from your point of view about creating that. Well, I think uh, it started with <clears throat> Neil Corbold's special effects rig. So there was a radio-controlled animatronic that could um, charge around the arena. So it looked great already to start with. It uh, gave all the actors um, something to react to because it looked intimidating and terrifying. Kicked up a lot of dust, which is great for us. We could take all that kind of thing. Um, it had a kind of a gate to it as well, which is very important because the actor riding on top has to has to react and has to be believably moving as a rhino charges around. So a lot of that is kind of selling performance, you know, left, right, and centre. Because without the performance, it's not going to work. Um, so beyond that, then Ridley had a, an, a design for a white rhino. We um, we matched that design, and uh, and then we kind of pretty much replaced uh, the animatronic for many many shots because obviously he didn't have legs and, and so on, so we uh, put our rhino in there, um, and, uh, and off we went. Mm -hmm. uh, well, Ridley, one of the most impressive and exciting sequences in the movie is when you fill the Coliseum with water and have sharks and all of that kind of thing. I mean, where did that idea come from to put sharks in Gladiator? Well, we knew that they did have water in the arena. I mean, they had great aqueducts everywhere, so to not have aqueducts, four or eight aqueducts running into the Colosseum would be really dumb when you build a Colosseum like that physically. And so getting water in was easy. We knew they had smaller fish like moray eels that will still, they won't kill you, but they'll bite you. Um, and therefore, if you can build the Colosseum, you can't get a six-foot shark, then there's something seriously wrong with you. <laughs> Well, you know, I'm curious, too, from John and Arthur and Mark, I mean, how closely are the three of you collaborating? Because it sounds like a lot of this, there's such great interaction between cinematography, production design, visual effects. I mean, um, 
how much interaction is between the three of you and what kinds of conversations are going on all through production? Well, I think from my point of view, it's hand in glove with Mark. Uh, every, every sequence was a discussion. There's previs involved. There's a lot of uh, sort of plates uh, and imagery run for, uh, by Ridley with them. See where we're going, if we're going the right way. It's a process of collaboration. And then when John comes on board, it's, uh, it all changes. <laughs> well, you know, what you must remember is that with all the components already there, delivered on time, on budget, uh, exactly when we want them, on the floor, there's one very important person. That's the first AD. The first AD drives the floor. And I learned in commercial advertising, the most powerful thing, the fastest thing, is the relationship between the camera operator and the first AD. They drive the engine. And if, assuming everything is there, then to that, everyone's got to stay with the pace of that engine. Well, and how important is it, you know, really, how much of your work is done before you even get to the floor? Because, it, you know, I once heard you say that one of the hardest things in filmmaking is just getting the script right. And here you've got a great script. I mean, how long did it take you guys to get to a script that was worthy of the original Gladiator? Well, people say it was. It took so long. In the time it took, I did 20 movies. So I wasn't agonizing about what I'm going to do for Gladiator 2. And during that time, I did 20 movies in the 25th. So in that time, on the weekends, I think, well, we should do something about Gladiator 2. Because Gladiator 2, or Gladiator 1 took on its own life. It, did, it was one of those films that would not bow out and take the curtain call. And I think you can thank all the platforms, the global platforms for that. Because every, I can press a button whether I'm in Japan Australia, South Africa, or wherever I am, and see the duelist that I shot 47 years ago. And it's as beautiful as the day I shot it. So if, if, when a film, it's not the, it doesn't end with the box office. It, it goes on and on. So Gladiator kept going on and on. I kept people telling me, I love Gladiator. I said, when did you see that? And they said, where in Australia? When? On Thursday. So, so I realized that it, w it will not go away, and we must have a, we, we must have a sequel. Uh, well, you know, it's interesting you talk about your earlier films. I mean, one of the things that really inspires me about you is you seem more excited and more ambitious about filmmaking now than ever. And I'm just curious for you. I mean, you've, you, you feel like you've kind of conquered the world with these movies. I mean, what keeps you excited and what keeps you challenged at this point? Um... I'm already wrecking in Italy for the next one, which I shoot in three months. Paul Mescal will be the lead. Um, and I feel alive when I'm doing a movie. Well, I think that's, uh, maybe that's a great note to end on. Uh, it's a great movie. I, you should all be very proud. And I really appreciate you all taking the time to come out and talk with me about it. So thank you. Thank Good. you.